This tonight will be our 20th installment in this review of Ephesians. <clears throat> I've entitled this The Commonality Among Men. Doctrinally, as well as uh, in reality, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a statement of the case. As ye all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some sinned uh, without the law. Some sinned with the law. But all have sinned. Some have sinned where the gospel has never been preached. Some have sinned where the gospel has been preached, but all have sinned. Some have uh, fallen into deep immorality. Some have lived relatively acceptable lives as men count things, but all have sinned. Come short of the glory of God. Salvation is for sinners. It is calculated for sinners. If a person ever forgets that he came out of that category, salvation has no relevance at all. Yeah. All of his benefits are obtained by faith. They're also obtained by people that were sinners. And know it. Now, as soon as uh, men present the gospel as though it was fundamentally intended for the old or the young or men or women, or Jews, or Greeks, or bond, or free, or rich, or poor, they're going to be forced to distort the gospel. That's right. Amen. Now, they may call their work a ministry, I understand, but they don't know what they're talking about. The gospel is for sinners. If they're not presently sinners, they were sinners. And it's calculated for that. As difficult as it may be for some to receive, Jesus has never represented as an answer to human dilemmas. I don't know of any place he's represented like that in Scripture. He can heal your marriage. See, this is terminology I don't condone this, but this is the kind of language that's used in our day. Heal marriages and heal your finances and meet your personal needs. And, but I don't know that Jesus has ever presented that way in Scripture. You'll be better. You'll do better. you have more. Have less problems. Be able to go through things easier. If Jesus, if you have Jesus. I don't know that he's presented that way in Scripture. He certainly not presented as a means to good health and financial security. Whatever you may think about those things, that's not how Jesus is presented. That's what we're talking about now, how Jesus is presented. See, we're today we're in a religious culture that's basically self-centered. So they have a twisted and distorted the gospel to suit that kind of people. But the catch is, the gospel isn't suited for those kind of people. It's, it's not even addressed to those kind of people. Amen. God doesn't have any good news for those kind of people. That's the truth of the matter. Amen. All of the various admonitions to believers are in view of the fact of the existence of Satan 
and the propensity to sin. And then all of the admonitions to move on and grow up and so forth is with that in the, with that in the background. That's a black cloth on which the diamond of redemption is positioned. And if you take that black cloth away, it doesn't look like a diamond anymore. It just looks like a hunk of glass. That's the way it is. That's what Paul is doing. So we're going to get a failure to go on to perfection can be traced back to forgetting that they were sinners. Amen. <laughs> That's, Amen. He's traced right back to that. Forgot what pit from which they were digged. As Isaiah said, all slowness of heart and spiritual retardation is because people forgot what they were before they came to Christ. That's why people let their guard down. That's why they become slothful. They think they've come further than they've really come. You can still, you don't have to look too far back mm -hmm. to recognize what you were, what you were when he found you. And then the whole situation is complicated by the fact that the old man is still with us, who, who was the that's the part of us that was in that old life. It's still with us. Yeah. Oh, still has all the basic propensities had before. Okay. That's why it's important to remember this. We have not been liberated from all sinful influence. Mm -hmm. that's right. In fact, salvation is calculated to work in the midst of the existence of all the inclinations you had before except now they've been crucified. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't crucify them, they'll be just as dominant as they ever were before. Yes. So the capacity to return to sin, you're toting it around in your body. Uh -huh. See, a lot of people, they forget this. They, they, they have a distorted view of salvation. They think they've been liberated from any kind of inclination sinward. Well, they haven't. Right. You've got to crucify, you've got to deny fleshy lusts that war against the soul and so forth. So that's we're going to touch on that some tonight. This is our text, Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Amen. Now, this, is a, this is addressed to a church that was doing very well. Now he refreshes our mind where we maintained our former manner of life. You think, you think yeah, it wouldn't be necessary to steer people up with this, but it is because of the existence of the Adamic natures that you still have. Yeah. Among whom we all had maintained our manner of life or manner of life Conversation means manner of life, or we conducted ourselves, or formerly lived, or once lived and conducted ourselves. See, some people don't think they really did this. Yeah. They say something like, well, I was raised in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean this isn't your past here. Yeah, right. You were raised little up. That, tells, that doesn't mean that this, doesn't, this text doesn't apply to you. You just had a little more refined yeah. condition, but it was still, you were still alienated from God, and you still had to be born again. Didn't make any difference how much Bible you knew when you were three years old. Yeah, right. That didn't change your nature. That little sweet three year old spit in your face sometimes. Disobey you without a twinge of conscience at all. Those fine little little children who can quote the scripture and do very well, they, they can make you mad, make you just as hot as hot as a firecracker sometimes with their stubbornness and insolence. Why? 
No, because they had they had to be born again. They, we all had our we all had our whether we were young or not. We all had our past as sinners. Are you speaking from our background from the standpoint of redemption in Christ Jesus? That's how he's addressing it. He's not speaking socially or domestically or comparing ourselves with one another. That's that's not the way he's talking. He's already said we were dead in trespasses and sins. And that we walked according to the course of the world. And that we were in harmony with the prince of the power of the air. And that we were children of disobedience. He's already told us that, that we were this. It didn't make a difference how old we were. This is what we were. The gospel addresses people on this level. It didn't address people as those who have made some cultural advance. This isn't how it addresses people. The gospel is a priest different to the Athenian philosophers who probably maintained some code of morality as compared to people in Corinth who, whose gods were worldly lusts in the past. It's the same gospel preached to both groups. It's addressed to people on this level. That's why the background of Scripture is never from a worldly culture point of view. And I've heard all this malarkey all my life. I, it incenses me. I wish someone would have a nerve enough to say it to me right out so we could get down to how foolish it is. And they say, well, that was the culture. They had this culture. This text is written with the culture in mind. This is a lie. There's no text of Scripture that's written because of culture. Unless it's spiritual culture, it's written with this background we're talking about in mind. It addresses humanity from this level. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't make any difference if they're a college professor or a drunk that sleeps under the bridge. Okay, just, 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 just a different category of death, but it was all the same. All of Satan's children aren't despots. Some of Satan's children are pretty nice people, good citizens, noble inventors, good musicians, gifted mechanics. <laughs> yeah, all his children are despots and morally, morally depraved. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Although we may have escaped some of the baser sins and parents should attempt to raise their children as best they can not to be involved in that kind of stuff because you, it creates a dreadful memory and you know, it's a hook Satan can pull people back into the world with. Even though they lived in one of the better rooms of the house, the house is still condemned. The whole house is condemned. Didn't make any difference if you were in one of the upper suites <laughs> or down in the basement. The whole house was condemned. That's the point. That's what he's pointing out here. It's helping people not to look at each other and say, "Well, I didn't do that. I wasn't that bad." So it's not to look at it that way. Yeah. Rather, you say, "Well, I was alienated from God. I was a child of disobedience." I was a follower of Satan's ways. I was walking according to the course of the world. I was dead in trespass and sins. Now, that's, that's a proper assessment. Yes, amen. That's the way it is. Now, he says, among whom, <coughs> among whom we all had our conversation <coughs> in time past, he brings up this line of demarcation again. He, he already mentioned it. Time passed. Now, he says, time has passed. He already mentioned there's there's something something happened that there's part of our life is past and there's part that's current. He's not speaking from the standpoint of time. He's speaking from the standpoint of experience. There's a line of demarcation. Something happened that changed the way we lived in the past and the way we live now. It's different. Whether men wish to admit it or not, this is where we live prior to being born again, in a condemned house, dead in trespasses and sins, 
following the course of the world, which is the broad road that leads to destruction. And Satan just working at us, working in us. We were doing his will, children of disobedience. That's where we all were in times past. All of us. As I say in the verse 1, verse 2, he referred to time past. So he just takes just one big lump. It just takes that whole period of time past. Now he the times past. So there were different stages, different experiences, this sort of thing. And they're distinct from where we are in Christ. They're distinct. If it's hard for you to see any difference in where you are in Christ and where you were out of Christ, then you really gotta you got to get serious about this matter of assessing yes, what it means to be alienated from God and what it means to be led up led by the devil and what it means to be following the course of the world, what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. That's all very serious language. As a lake of fire. Or, or glories of heaven language, one, one, you know, one or the other. So it's the most serious condition to be in. We live differently in the past. So if you're not living the same now, see, they're telling you why. Something happened. And the something that happened, of course, was the new birth or regeneration or justification or reconciliation to God. There's a number of sanctifications. There's a number of ways it's stated, but... The difference was that you, your position with God was changed. First, you changed your nature so that you'd feel comfortable in God's presence. And then he began to work with you, and your life was different. You had a different reason for living. You saw life differently. You considered life differently. When you're dead in trespasses and sins, you don't think like you do when you're reconciled to God. Not at all. We viewed God differently. We viewed the Son differently. We viewed the Scriptures differently, the Gospel differently. Now he goes into the, uh, gives a little detail for us. In the lusts of our flesh. Now, some places he uses the word the flesh, but it's just, it gets pretty personal here. In the lusts of our flesh. Some of the varying versions, the NIV says the cravings of our sinful nature. The revised standing version says the passions of our flesh. The basic Bible English says the pleasures of our flesh. The Holcomb Bible says the passions of our old nature are Fleshly desires, the Christian Standard Bible, the Living Bible, expressing the evil within it, the evil desires of our human nature, governed by the inclinations of our lower nature, this Weymouth, ruled by the selfish desires of our bodies and mind, New Century Bible. Trying to please our sinful selves, English Revised Version. Doing what we felt like doing, that's the Message Bible. Our behavior is governed by a corrupt and sensual nature, Amplified Bible. So they all pretty much, they all, there's no doubt what the text says. But all of this has to do with being self-centered or selfish. They all have to do with that. But the truth of the matter was, in the past, we lived strictly for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, we may have chosen a cultured road, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. to do it, but it was still for self. Mm -hmm. We planned our future was a, with our self in mind. Mm -hmm. We got a job as, with our self in mind. We lived according to our own sinful nature. We, what we were by nature, which, is, which has a bronze heaven, which you are by nature, you can't get off the earth. Uh -huh. It's just the way it is. You have no access to God. N zero. None at all. You're confined to the world. And the desires of the flesh or the desires of the lower nature, some version puts it, 
they're all self-centered. The basic desire is not for the other person, it's for you. Now, the prevailing thought sometimes about sins of the flesh is the baser sins. That's what people think of. Like adultery and fornication and theft, witchcraft and things like that. The way they think living in the flesh, that's, that's the thing they think about. But it's not limited to that at all. There's expressions like uncleanness, hatred, variance, emulations, trying to be something you're not, strife, seditions, heresies as religious divisions, and such like. There's things like covetous and railers. You see, everything... Walking in the flesh just isn't these baser, baser sins. There's pride. There's arrogance. There's forgetfulness of God. There's a lot of things fall into this category. Jesus even spoke of prayers that were made by pretense. See, this is this is after the flesh, after the selfish manner. And those who, Jesus spoke of those who love the uppermost seats in the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. And it's at the religious conferences there up on the stage, you know. Yeah. He loved that. See, they, that's flesh. Even though it was religious flesh, it was flesh. And you know, like I said, they love to be saluted in the marketplace. Oh, Dr. Smith, it's really good to see you. Yeah. They love that. I remember saying to a person, a doctor, so one time I said, you know what a degree is? He said, what is it? I said, it's a way of distinguishing one worm from another. Yeah. He failed to see the humor in it, so I said, well, it wasn't meant to be humorous. <laughs> <laughs> see, these, to walk in the flesh... We all had our conversation, our manner of life in times past, in the lusts of our flesh. That is, we were wanted to grant it. We wanted our wants are what dictated what we did. It's to speak of a life that's lived, from a practical viewpoint, just as though there's no God. If there was no God, the person wouldn't live any differently. They live the same way. And they only have self-interest. Now, viewing the past from another perspective, Paul writes of the death of Christ and it attaches a reason why he died. He said, He died for all that they which they which live should not henceforth, that's from the time of their identity with Christ on, live unto themselves, which... That's how they were living before. But unto him which died for them and rose again. Now, if you've been around for a while, you know how rare it is to find a person who lives so solely for God, solely for Christ. They don't live for themselves. They're living solely for Christ. Their life is governed with Christ in mind. They make their decisions with Christ in mind. They go places with Christ in mind. They choose occupation with Christ in mind. They, they view their idle time with Christ in mind. <laughs> they look at opportunities with Christ in mind. You know, it's, it's rare, but this is why Christ died. And not to, have, not to live like that is to live in the lust of the flesh. That's what it is. There's no nice way to, to say it. How does living in the, after the lust of the flesh is the opposite of doing whatever you do in word or deed, doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now, living in the flesh is just the exact opposite of, of that. Now, conversion separates these two modes of living. Living for self versus living for the glory of God. 
Now, the separation is as real as the forgiveness of sins. This is not a theoretical like we ought to. It's not like that. The person who's converted does not live that way anymore. He lives this way. Otherwise, he hasn't been converted. The separation is very real. A life lived for the glory of God, that's just as certain as being washed, sanctified, and justified. Why would salvation cause you to be washed, sanctified, and justified, but fail to enable you to live unto him that loved you and gave himself for you? Well, how could that be? But this idea is, is extant, I mean, present in the Christian community. There are people that still think you can really be saved, really belong to Christ, and yet really be anchored to the world and live for self. But no, this is not so. I heard it taught that you taper off. <laughs> you know, once you're in Christ, you still, you still have your same hang-ups and habits, but you just taper off, yeah. you know, over time. With the help of some programs, yeah been identified to have too much enthusiasm they send them the Bible because it burns them that energy off. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Settle down a little bit. That's right. Mm -hmm. You're a little bit too high. Come yeah. on down here. Come on down here again. That's what I learned about cultural relevance though. Mm -hmm. About that. That's I didn't right. Know nothing about that till I got there. That's right. Oh. Well I've been told a lot of times since I've moved to our fair city Lighten up, Brother Given. Lighten up. To which I reply, sober up, Brother. Sober up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've been told that a lot. So certain meetings I went to, invariably I was told that. See, we've been chosen in him from the foundation of the world and predestined unto adoption and made accepted in the beloved, which means a very real change has taken place because we weren't any of that before. So in the time, time times passed, we walked in the lusts of our flesh. We were, so to speak, our own God. What we wanted, if someone contradicted what we thought, we argued with them. If someone set forth a goal we didn't like, we resisted it. We, it was us. We might have been kind of nice about it, but that still was kind of basically it. For all, this is a free country. That's a kind of a favorite saying of these kind of people in this part of the world. It's a free country. Where they say something like, well, it's my life. Wrong. No, it's not your life. Amen. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price, Amen. Whether, you, whether you know it or not. But see, he's bringing this out just to remind us. What happens when you see this, then the jewel of redemption gets brighter, see? Yeah. Amen. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. Now Paul's going to encapsulate what it means to live in the flesh to the lusts of the flesh. The word flesh is used here has to do with the part of us is traced back to Adam. Essentially, it's the human nature that's driven by desires and ambitions that have to do with being in the body. That's why it's called flesh, see? You're not limited to this, but because you're in a body is how you think this way, because you're in a body and unredeemed. There's an intangible nature that is derived, of course, from Adam as well, as an, an, a body with a certain nature. The intangible nature that's derived from Adam, all sinners in self-interest. That's how sin got its start. Eve got to thinking about herself. She knew, she knew what God had said about that tree. Mm -hmm. She said, well, looks good for food. Food for who? Me. Looks good to make the desire to make one wise. Make who wise? Me. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm just saying. Just pleasant to the eye. Whose eye? Mine. Yeah. See how Satan did? He got her. He got her eyes turned inward. As soon as she did. See, God's made man so he cannot live successfully with his eye off God. He may think he can, but he can't. Man's created the dependent person. All right, now we fulfill the desires of the flesh. The wishes of our old nature, some versions put. Now, flesh, that's a key term in Scripture, and yet it... Uh, it's kind of gradually disappearing from the religious vocabulary. Yeah. Flesh. Some prefer the term sinful nature. And there's what there's hot debates on how sinful nature really is. Some say it's totally depraved. Some say, no, it's not totally. Everything's depraved but the will. And there's all kind of debates about using this term. So I like flesh. It's the kind of term you have to do some thinking to figure out what it what it means, the desires of the flesh. The scriptures tell us that the motions of sin are in the human nature. Here's our reason, Romans 7, 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. The mo it's an interesting phrase, the motions of sin. Sin is like an agitated ocean. It's moving about, find, trying to find some avenue of expression. Amen. That's what sin is, the motions of sin. And it's set in motion by God's law, Amen. which are by the law. That's what it says. The motions are with the, by the law. So man is so different by nature from God that if God says, do this, he puts, says, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. See? <laughs> We've said this before, but it's like a, like you got an inch of dust on the floor and you decide to take a broom and clean the floor. When you sweep it, the dust fills the air. That's, that's how sin, as soon as the law gets doing its work, uh -huh. there's all kind of release for sin. That's a natural reaction to the offensiveness of the law to the natural man. It's a natural reaction. When we're in the flesh, that is the the room of nature was the room we chose, that's where we lived. The room we come out into and you come out of the womb. You come into this room. And in this, the sinful nature was aroused. Motions of sin begin to work. And Romans 7.25 says, The flesh serves sin. With my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Your flesh will never do anything else. So if you walk in the flesh, <laughs> you sin. With, with the flesh... I serve the law of sin. What's the answer to that? Don't live in the flesh. That's the answer to it. You can't live in the flesh. You can't revert to a natural way of thinking without sinning. Because the law agitates, agitates sin. And the flesh serves sin. Flesh has self, purely self-interests. It's all it has. And when God says, you shall not and you shall, that's an encroachment on the will of the natural man. <laughs> so you're not going to dictate to me. I got my rights. After all, we got life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's, we've all got that right. Well, no, we don't all have that right. The reason the, the law is so offensive to the flesh is because the law demands that you recognize God. That's right. And not Very self. Good. Very good. Yeah. You'll not live, let a person live in ignorance of God. Shouts in his ear, the Lord said, thus saith the Lord. He shouts it in his ear. Notice the description states, we fulfilled the desires of the flesh. 
So we just didn't like have desires and that was it. We fulfilled them. Took some thinking to fulfill some of them. Took some plotting and planning. We're hearing a lot these days about the politicians who have fulfilled the lust of the flesh and they had to make certain arrangements and plan to meet people at a certain time and place. And had to be planned out to fulfill. See, to fulfill the lust of the flesh, you gotta be pretty smart, actually, to figure out a way to do it without being detected. Of course, you, you can't sin without being detected. That's the catch of the matter. We may have thought our ambitions were honorable, but they were not because they were self-centered. And they fulfill the desires of the mind. It's interesting that he separates the mind from the flesh. Talks about the flesh, he's talking about, some versions use the word passions. It's, it's kind of connected with feeling. Feeling isn't a strong enough word, but it's a inclination. Sometimes there's just something in your body awakens. If you don't check it, you have some real trouble. Yeah, an appetite, or appetite or hunger. That's what I mean. Like, like a person who came from a drinking background, it would awaken an appetite. It wasn't like a, a mental thing. It was a sensual thing that that happened. But there's the there's the mind fulfilling the desires of the mind. The carnal mind or the mind set on the flesh. <clears throat> as the New American Standard reads, is enmity against God. All right, that's a statement of Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity, it's hostile against God. It's not merely that it doesn't think like God. It's not, that's not deep enough. It's not just that God's not at the heart of things. It cannot think with God in mind. Carnal mind's that way. Can't do it. Yeah. That's why people sin. You can't sin without not thinking about God. Yeah. You can't do it. Yeah, that's right. You can't sin without blotting out all these things God has said and heaven, and day of judgment, and death, and all this. You got to blot that all out of your mind to live for self. Amen. Because all those facts are like checkmates yeah. to the expression of sin. But we fulfill the desires of flesh and mind. We thought things up and then did them. Mm -hmm. Solomon said they sought out many evil inventions. Yeah. Think how many different ways people that love drugs have sought to ingest them. Think, about, oh, yeah. think how creative, yeah. how creative they've been. And pleasures that have to do with fornications. Think how creative people have been fulfill the desires of the flesh and mind so the mind can think out ways to do things. <clears throat> when Eve saw the tree, it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, tree desired to make one wise. That was all processed in the mind. That Those weren't feelings, that was the mind. See, the feelings, they come after you've already participated. Once you participated in it, then You've got the feelings that can be awakened, but until in a, just the mind, Satan tries to encroach upon the mind. And it's carnal mind. That, that's where the seat of these desires of the flesh resides. That's right. Yeah. Would, would that be? Yes, amen. And, and that's the amen. part Once Satan you... has access to. Amen. That's the part that Satan has access amen. to that can awaken yeah. these. Amen. <clears throat> so if a person has a carnal mind, this is like a wide open door. This is the door of your mind is open to Satan to come in, to work. Carnal mind. There is a way of thinking that not only competes with God, but it's hostile toward him. Like personal ambitions contradict God's ambitions for the person. God has certain desires for the person. But the personal desires compete and with the desires God has. He desires good for the person, for the person to be cleansed, dwell forever in the house of the Lord, but the person's personal desires compete against that. 
all of that might appear to be quite acceptable, to say things like, well, that's just not the way I see it. If you've heard someone say that, that's, uh, that's just not the way I see it. We all have a right to our, our opinion. Let's, be for, let's just agree to be disagreeable. That's just the way you interpret it. That's the way you interpret it. But see, that's, those aren't proper sayings at all. That's right. Because uh, to contradict what God has said, that's how you're down in serious business then. Yeah. Yeah, Brother Gilman, this is, the, this is the, the falseness of, if you're going to walk like this, then you, you, you can't stand in front of the brother and say, well, you can't know me after the flesh. Yeah. If you insist on walking like this, yeah. then... That's exactly what people are going to see. Oh, yeah. Then, yeah, if you walk after the blessed, don't ask us not to see it. <laughs> Pray that some of us do see it and tell you to stop. Amen. Yes, amen. Though it's difficult for me to see anything as being more serious than this, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, going about to... Some people will go into gigantic debt to fulfill the desires of the flesh and the mind. Yeah. They'll live above their means yeah. to fulfill the flat desires of the flesh and the mind. Then they'll ask you to cry with them when they lose their job. Yeah. We're seeing this happen, see, all around us, this kind of thing is happening. Yeah. He doesn't end there. He keeps, on, he keeps on elaborating on this, like a flower blooming out. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Ooh, now, now that sounds a little more, that gets my attention. Children of wrath. See, the Lord has already targeted what he's going to do with his church. He's going to present, to, he's going to present it to himself, a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. All right, that's his, that's what he's doing. Self-centeredness doesn't think this way. Self-centered doesn't think, you know, what can I do so that Jesus will not be ashamed of me when he comes and can present me without spot and without wrinkle or any such thing. Flesh doesn't think this way. These objectives are compel Paul to correct the misgivings of the Corinthians. He knew where God was headed. They'd embraced a gospel that wasn't headed in that direction. So the church at, Cor church at Corinth and Galatia, who had both embraced another gospel, he sought to correct them because he knew what God's objective was, and there's no way there could be two objectives. It can't be God's objective and my objective. It, one's got to yield, and if a person insists on his objective, God backs off. If they follow God's objective, then they tailor their life around that. Now, you can't make people do this, but we probably should do the best we can to make them. Yeah. Make it uncomfortable not to do it. Now, with the Colossians, the philosophers are drawing them aside, see? And the people who observe days and meets and all this sort of thing. So he warned them about this, get them on target. Don't, don't, that's, the, that's the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Try to get them corrected. The Hebrews, they were, they forgot the penalty for decentralizing Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? To correct that, correct that propensity because he knows the broad road leads to destruction. Yeah. You don't embrace God's purpose. Like you're going to be damned. It's the way it's going to be. Someone's got to just come right out and say it. Quit being what they used to call a mealy mouth. <laughs> but these things moved Paul to write the way he did to get these things corrected. Now at the Ephesians, who are noted for their faith in Christ and love of the brethren, he writes to firm up what must be accomplished in the church. <clears throat> They've got to grow up into Christ in all things. They can't just rest on their laurels. You, you have faith, we love the brethren, hallelujah, we've made it. 
Every, everybody knows we have faith. Everybody knows we love the brethren. Nah, but that, you got to keep going. Got to grow up into Christ in all things. To put on a new man, put off the old man. For some people, they might think this is unnecessary. After all, we're the workmanship of God. Does God make faulty product? No. But what he creates is in a vessel. Yeah. Ah, an earthen vessel. <laughs> That's a situation. It's not as simplistic. People say, can I lose my salvation? Can I be unborn? They ask foolish questions like this. They forget we've got the treasure in an earthen vessel. That's the point of vulnerability. And that earthen vessel is accessible to Satan. God has put us in an environment and a condition where we have to make a choice. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Make that choice. And he does quite a bit of tutoring about what the choice is and why it's why it's the best choice. So That's right. It's valid warnings. See, so when a person sins, it's not as innocent as sometimes people say. It's important that we consider what we were. Because, as I have mentioned, the remnants of the former self still are with you. That's the complicating factor. This is how God has chosen to do this. Why? Because this filters out the unstable Amen. and the pretentious. That's why. He leaves the enemy like a Trojan horse. Leaves the enemy there. He does tell you how to deal with it. So it doesn't catch you unawares. But if you do not take it seriously, what he says to do, that enemy that's within will overcome you. Amen. May alert. May alert. Amen. See, some will say, well, he made us accepted in the beloved. How is it that we could not be accepted? Because of this dichotomy, yeah. old and new, in one body. That's, that's the point. Yes. God has set it up in such a way that in the end, there's going to be no question about the work that he, he was doing. That he, he was making a people for himself, and those people chose him and had a desire for him. It's not going to be, it won't be any question that, that remember, you, you've said this before, that we're not going to be anybody that's going to get there and says, how did I get to heaven? No, we know that's right. how we got to glory. And we, we are meant to be there. That's right. See, every time we meet together, this is why we stir one another up, not only with what's ahead, uh -huh. but to remind us, let's not be forgetting yeah. where we're at. We're in a hostile world. We're in a body that can't get in. Mm -hmm. Flesh and blood can't enter. That's right. And we're an adversary that's looking for an opportunity. So we got. That's why we stir one another up to be alert. Yeah. We were by nature children of wrath. And by nature, by nature means a state apart from Christ. We were by nature. It is this is the way we were without Christ. We were children of wrath. I'm going to have to cut this a little short, brother, and I'm sorry I'll do my best to finish as much as I can here. If a person only possesses natural traits, as traits that are at home in the world, or traits that come from Adam, wrath is the destination. Yeah. We're by nature children of wrath. That is, we're children destined uh -huh. Uh -huh. to wrath. Our natural condition, we were headed for God's wrath. That's what one version says. We were then by nature children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation. I mean, those, uh, 
Those are very arresting words to me. Amen. To say such a thing to the saints of God. We were, this is what we were. Uh -huh. In other words, if God hadn't have intervened, mm -hmm. this is where we would have been. God, God had, without us asking, uh -huh. God had to intervene yes. and change this course of direction. Our course of living had to change. Our nature had to change. If it didn't, there was no alternative for God mm -hmm. but to pour out his wrath upon us because uh -huh. the fire goes before him and consumes everything that's contrary to him. Right. We were children of wrath, even as others. It wasn't just our condition. Yeah. Some versions say like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how you reconcile those words with God loves everybody. I don't know how you can, like, yeah. reconcile those words. <laughs> I can't. This is a universal condition, not an isolated one. Mm -hmm. Apart from Christ, everybody's in the garbage dump. Amen. And destined for God's wrath. That's, right. That's the way it is. Whoever doesn't believe on the Son, the wrath of God, Jesus says, is abiding on him. He's under this sentence. So Paul is showing the Ephesians that God, God's love has undergirded his purpose, but God's love does not stand by itself. It stands on the foundation of God's purpose. And God's nature. And if a person doesn't blend with God, so they think like God and they act like God, so to speak, and they pattern their lives after God, whatever they may think about God's love, they're God's enemies. And God's wrath is going to consume them. Why well, remind God's people of something like this? Because it is a, it's a hard message. Because it makes for alertness. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, why. Right. Because God doesn't have a preference to pour out his wrath. Mm -hmm. See, this isn't go, go what God prefers to do. God prefers mercy, mm -hmm. not judgment. Mm -hmm. That's the way God is. Mm -hmm. But people had to be warned about this. Or Satan will lull them into a, a stupor mm -hmm. where they like they aren't aware of these things. So we remind one another of this, not to be, as they say, negative, mm -hmm. but to be sensitive <laughs> and alert yes. to what God's doing in the earth. Mm -hmm. You won't live very long after tonight before you'll find you oh, there'll be something you wish you didn't do and something you wish you didn't see you hadn't have said. This will happen. Right. Why? Well, because there's these competing desires, and if you're not close to God, they catch you off, mm -hmm. catch you off guard. Yeah. First thing you know, you say something, you would to God, you hadn't have said it, but there you went and said it. Mm -hmm. Why did you say it? Well, you weren't alert enough. This is how you didn't just when you judge yourself, examine yourself, confess it to God, and seek to fortify your soul mm -hmm. so that these these things don't occur. Yeah. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? It's, uh, it's like a skilled doctor doing a diagnosis. Whenever you go to a doctor, that's the first thing they do is make an observation. And the reason is to get down to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. We're really not interested in doctors that treat symptoms yeah. because it doesn't really correct the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's really fundamentally what, psych what a, a counseling approach to resolving people's problems does. It just diagnoses the behavior and tries to create some modifications through outward. But see, yes. they're missing this. Yes, amen. When you realize that really the root of man's problem is his nature is in conflict with God's nature, now you've left the field of possibility among the human race because there's not a man that can change the nature of another man. Amen. So now you're left to God. Only God can do this. So when, see, when you're looking at this from a believer and you're looking back on this, this makes for great thanksgiving. Amen. God has done for us what no man on earth could possibly have done. Yeah, praise God. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're told. The pattern of 
prior preaching too, because now God ed had to educate men about sin, the world. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. yes, sir. You know, so He had to shut the mouths of men, and yeah. and so that mankind would be guilty before God. So now. Uh, we understand about God's election and His purposes and all that stuff, but this is the message that we have to preach. Mm -hmm. You know uh, that all men have fallen short, uh -huh. and then uh, and then the message of redemption. Because I mean, God, we had God had to get us to see sin first. Amen. So that's what we we had to bring men to this awareness. You they, you missed that step. That's right. Yeah. Then when the person running the race and fighting the fight, you can tell them these other right. these other good things, which will. Yeah. They'll, they'll keep you fighting, but they don't get you fighting. Yeah, see? Uh -huh. see, there's a difference. See? Yep. It, they keep you running, they don't start you running. Uh -huh. yep. Yes? I want to add to what Brother Ricky was saying, that doctors uh, uh, only treat the symptoms, any kind of doctor treats the symptoms, but God saves, heals, and delivers. That's right. Amen. 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 Speak to a lost person from. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, he could. And say, I was in this condition. Yeah, yeah. we're in it now. Yeah. Yeah. And not and not approach them from from the standard yeah. perspective of oh God loves you. He oh, loved yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. That's not the message of scripture. Right. This is the message of scripture Amen. to a rebellious lost Amen. person. Amen. 